very much for coming. We're going to start. Uh, we're very pleased to have here today uh, Professor Sir Richard uh, Sarabji uh, to give a lecture co-authored with uh, Michael Redhead. Michael Redhead, uh, we have the pleasure of having him join us here in the audience. Got him right here. So there he is. So say hi to Michael. Hi, Michael. <laughs> Hello, Michael. <laughs> All right. Uh, and uh, without further ado, thank you for coming to the Sigma Club. Richard? Well, thank you very much. I must correct one thing. Uh, I, I, this is not co-authored with me. Today I'm just a voice. Ah, okay. <laughs> Michael is the sole author. Uh, but thank you very much, um, uh, uh, all of you who arranged this and corresponded with me and made it all happen. Um, and, and it's very nice that Roland Redhead, uh, one of Michael's uh, three sons, is, is here in the audience. Uh, Uh, Michael is uh, so innovative in every way, both in his uh, academic work, but also uh, who else, when confined to barracks, um, uh, uh, as he is at the moment, um, who else would actually be conversing all over the world every week? Uh, I speak to Michael on Skype uh, on Wednesdays, uh, but he's also doing these wonderful Sigma Club <coughs> Uh, interviews with colleagues and uh, former students and, uh, every week, uh, but this is another step forward made possible here in LSE because uh, now um, it's not just Michael questioning people, but you're going to be able to question Michael. Uh, and, and so he never runs out of invention. I don't think anybody uh, else I know, certainly nobody else I know who's been confined to barracks has done anything of the kind, but he's always expanding his activity ever wider. We've worked together for a very long time. I used to go to the lectures in Chelsea College. Um, just out of interest, I don't specialize in philosophy of science. Uh, then Heinz Post was the uh, number one, um, and very powerful character, although it's difficult to remember a time when Michael wasn't number one, in fact. Uh, but Heinz Post was the number one then. There was an occasion when Michael and Heinz Post and, uh, uh, and I were all at a performance of uh, Copenhagen. I don't know if you know the play about the um, uh, Niels Bohr and the meetings in Copenhagen about the nuclear bomb. That, must have, that was a particularly high powered audience for that play. Anyhow, after Chelsea, um, Michael came to join me in King's College um, um, with his own group um, and uh, I, I learned a little bit about relativity theory from him uh, and things like that um, uh, and then he went off to Cambridge I heard the, his inaugural lecture in fact when the ex-president of the Royal Society gave a most glowing report of him as number one in uh, philosophy of physics. And uh, what was rather remarkable in Cambridge was that there was a joint operation by, uh, by, by Michael and his dear wife because the philosophy of science seminars were much better attended than the whole of the philosophy program put together. It was partly, of course, Michael, but only partly. <clears throat> it was that his wife made the most delicious teas in Cambridge. <laughs> All these staffed postgraduate students came along and doubly motivated, and it was the most crowded uh, philosophy seminar in Cambridge. Uh, the other thing we did, besides discussing philosophy a great deal, was we both engaged in plots, uh, plots to make people cough up money to support philosophy and philosophers. And Michael was a much more skillful plotter than me, although there was something to be said for both methods, I think. But whereas I always looked very excited and enthusiastic when I had a plot in mind to make somebody fun of something in philosophy, uh, so that they could <coughs> see me a, a mile off and stop running away, Michael looked very absent-minded as if he had nothing important in mind. He looked rather 
rather vague. And uh, he used to say to these possible sources of funds or whatever it was he wanted done for the sake of philosophy, he spoke in a sort of rather abstracted fashion as if it was so minor it had almost slipped his mind. This was a very effective method of getting funding or, or, or new courses put on and so on. I think those who know Mike will, will recognize what I'm talking about. Now, let me just say once again, I'm in no way any author of this because Michael never taught me philosophy of mathematics or Gödel's theorem. He taught me a little bit about some other aspects of physics. So I couldn't possibly take part in the discussion here. Um, but I'm just supplying the voice. And this is in spite of the fact that we talk every week on Skype. But uh, Michael just wasn't sure whether, oh, e even with a short paper, he wasn't quite sure because he hadn't practiced this yet. Uh, he'd want to read a, a whole uh, paper aloud, even a short paper. So I'm just acting as the voice to read the short paper. And then, as I do every week, you'll be able to, to converse with Michael and put your questions to Michael. All right, thank you, Michael. I'll now start just reading aloud what you've written. A simplified version of Gödel's theorem, quote, isn't it the bad thing, says Plato, to be deceived about the truth and the good thing to know what the truth is? A close quote. Truth is valuable, but certifiable truth is hard to come by. Can you hear Michael? Can, can, can you hear all right? It's all right. Good. Okay. The case of mathematics. Does truth equate with proof? No. Gödel showed, famously, that truth outruns proof, even in the case of the natural numbers 0, 1, 2, 3. Note. We do not believe that religion involves the same situation as obtains for mathematics, but the ineffable nature of the subject allows a religious view. The Lucas Penrose argument. The argument that ascertainable truth outruns proof in mathematics has been used by John Lucas and Roger Penrose to claim that human mind can do things which computers can't do, and hence that minds can't be digital machines. Quotation from Lucas and Michael. We are dealing with a different style of reasoning, an informal semantics concerned with truth rather than proof. Skeptics deny that we have such a concept of truth. We cannot prove to them that we have, but we have many intimations of truth, not all of which can be articulated as proofs. Sorites arithmetic. This is the sort of arithmetic you learn at school. The basic operation is moving from one number to the next along the number line and repeating the operation a finite number of times. Addition and multiplication are defined recursively in the usual way. So addition is effectively reduced to adding one and one and one repeatedly and multiplication is repeated addition. We now have the machinery to check out some arithmetical facts like 279 times 681 equals 681 times 279. So write these axioms. One, zero is a number. Two, every number has a unique successor. Three, if two numbers have equal successors, then the numbers are equal. Four, every number other than zero is the successor of some number. Finally, recursive definitions of additions and multiplication are on the diagram. So now, it's rather important that you're within sight of the diagram. Uh, the diagrams are on the next page. So we've got an example here. 4 times 2 equals 2 times 4. Spare one? What is spare one? What do you find for spare one? Uh, 
Okay, is anybody missing? Yeah, Peter, not much as well. Anybody missing? Anybody who's not in sight of the diagrams? I think she has one now, so we're all set. Good. Uh, so we're first um, doing it in a geometrical way. I'll just give you uh, a few moments to look at the rows and the columns. And then on the bottom half of page two, we've got diagrams doing it in arithmetical terms. Let's pause a moment so you can have a look. All right, moving on. Indeed, for any pair of numbers, m and n, we can prove m times n equals n times n. But what we can't prove in Sorites arithmetic is the commutative law of multiplication, Cm, in the form for all pairs of numbers, m and n. m times n equals n times n. Why is this? Because as the numbers get bigger, the proof increases in length without limit. So there is no finite proof that will work for all pairs of numbers. And this can't be avoided. In other words, we can't make the transi transition from any to all. Compare any plum in this pudding is delicious. Um, yeah, in Dales, all the plums in this pudding are delicious. This is a perfectly valid argument because we are claiming that a typical plum is delicious, not in virtue of being that particular plum, but just in, being, in virtue of being a plum. But in the arithmetical example, there is no such thing as a typical pair of numbers. The detailed proof for any particular pair depends crucially on which pair you choose. But although we cannot prove CM, we can argue that it is true. It follows from one, now let me remind you what one is. One was on the previous page, uh, uh, which is printed only at the bottom. One was, if you remember, for any pair of numbers, m and n, we can prove m, and, uh, m times n equals n times m. But what we can't prove in Sorites arithmetic is the commutative law of multiplication C n. That, that was number one. So from one, it follows that three. For any pair of numbers, m and n, it is true that m times n equals n times m. But three is strictly equivalent to four. For it is true that for all pairs of numbers, m and n, m times n equals n times m. And for just is cm. So to repeat, in Sorites arithmetic, cm can't be proved. Notice that the argument depended crucially on the fact that the sequence, is, that the sequence of numbers is infinite. Note that we don't assume consistency. And for Gödel proofs of true but unprovable assertions, we have to assume consistency. Without this, nothing follows. Response. Why not introduce a new axiom to strengthen the Sorites arithmetic in such a way that CM can be proved? This step was taken by Piano in 1889. And in the resulting system, known as Piano Arithmetic, M is both true and provable. But in 1931, Gödel showed that examples could be given of unprovable statements in Piano Arithmetic, and indeed in any strengthening of Piano Arithmetic. Here are the Piano axioms. One, zero is a number. Two, every number has a unique successor. Three, if two numbers have equal successors, then the numbers are equal. Four, every number other than zero is the successor of some number. Five, the induction axiom. 
for any admissible predicate f, if f is true of 0, and if, given that f is true of n, then it is true of the successor of n, then it is true for all of n. Michael's claim is that the essence of the Lucas Penrose argument can be framed in the context of Sorites arithmetic and simple examples like CM, thus avoiding the formidable complexity of the Gödel construction. We notice that the syntactic proof can be formalized, the semantic proof cannot. This is because in order to formalize it, we would have to express the notion of truth and this is ruled out by Tarski's theorem on the undefinability of truth. The definable truths are at most denumerable, whereas there are non-denumerable sets of numbers. Notice that the Gödel theorem say that if a sufficiently strong version of arithmetic is consistent, then the result follows. But we cannot prove consistency. <coughs> by the second theorem. This is the basic conundrum. We have to assume consistency, but this moves outside the formalized theorems. Inductive support, what, what Michael is relying on, inductive support is provided by the fact that no inconsistencies have so far been produced. Syntactic means referring to grammar instead of semantic, which refers to meaning as well as grammar. Gödel places great stress on the constructivist aspect of syntax, but the argument leads to a conundrum, as we have seen, which can only be solved in terms of the semantic approach in the way we have described. But does the argument show that minds are not machines? For any given unprovable statement, we can always work in a stronger state a system, where it becomes provable. Uh, this is used to deny the Lucas Penrose argument. But no machine can deal with all unprovable statements. This is the basis of the Lucas Penrose argument that we are following. Notice our argument for the truth of CM involves the semantic conception of truth, and moreover, the truth of statements which are universally quantified over, over infinite domains. In such a case, do we really have a clear conception of truth? In a slogan, is Cantor's paradise another name for La La Land? Of course, we are interested not in transfinite entities, but in a strict finitism, a possible let out for our argument. So that's the end of the paper, and it's given two references. It's a paper by himself, by Michael, in BJPS 2004, Mathematics and the Mind. And there's the, the joint paper with John Lucas, Michael Redhead and John Lucas, Truth and Provability in BJPS 2007.